Brad, welcome to the podcast. Casey, I'm excited to be here, man. Been looking forward to this one. I'm so excited to have a fellow front row dad here with me and also a business partner. You provided so much value to myself, our clients, our practice, and just uh, helped develop me as a husband and a father. And it's great to have uh, a lengthy conversation we're able to share here with our audience about the things that you do, the things that you provide, uh, the advisors that you work with. I think it's great. And, and one of the difficult things that people face as they start looking into getting getting in financial advisors. Who are these guys? Mm. And you're able to, you know, share so much experience from working with literally thousands of different advisors and say, you know, these are the good advisors. These are the ones you want to work with. Most people don't have the opportunity to interview a thousand different advisors, let alone two or three. And you have been able to sit in that chair doing just that. So that's why I'm so excited about this conversation. I know you're going to be able to provide just tremendous value. But as we kick this off, I think it's important for uh, those listening in to understand where you came from uh, or what you do exactly a coach to financial advisors that might seem foreign to some yeah it probably seems foreign to a lot um does this job even exist out there right so um yeah so small town kansas kid um grew up on a farm that's kind of where i got my start uh, married my high school sweetheart sarah we have three kids and so that you know you talked about the front row dads that's kind of job and priority number one for me. And then after that is what I do professionally. And um, it was interesting how I got in, introduced into the world of finance. I actually graduated from college, uh, played college football, which was what took me to, to Emporia State University. And then my very first job was for a little company that I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with, Payless Shoe Source, uh, you know, where, where everybody got their cheap sho shoes growing up. And um, I actually went uh, into IT, came out of college, worked there for three years, and I remember just sitting at my desk, and it was a great company, great people, but just miserable, you know, and I was like, I've got to be interacting with people. Um, I'm the type of person, I just like to be around people, I like conversation, and I had this tug I'd always been interested in finance. I'd kind of dabbled in, you know, investing in, I remember at the time Under Armour was IPOing, Google was IPOing. And so I was had this little play account and I just on a whim signed up for the CFP course and started taking that while I was in my job at Payless Shoe Source. And so one of my good friends, Sean, that I went to school with, he said, hey, I hear you're kind of quitting your job. I was going to go be a financial advisor. I'd interviewed with all of the names, you know, Ed Jones, Ameriprise, John Hancock, kind of those organizations a lot of people get into the business with. And he's like, hey, if you're quitting your job, um, there's this tiny little company called Advisors Excel. They just started in Topeka, Kansas. You should go interview with those guys. And so that was how I got to Advisors Excel. And little did I know what was in front of me and what was in front of the company because I joined as the 12th employee, this tiny little sleepy company, more of a startup. Uh, which is today uh, the largest uh, fixed brokerage company of annuities in the country, a top five brokerage company with life insurance and one of the fastest growing wealth management firms. So now we're, I think, closing in on 700 employees. And so it's just crazy that, you know, a little over a decade that's happened. But along this, this ride, basically what the company did was we would work with advisors like yourself and we would really, our value proposition was only work with the best, the top one to 2% in our industry, and then really dive in very deep, almost as an entrepreneurial coach, which was very unique and distinct in a brokerage type of uh, industry. Nobody was doing that at the time. Um, hindsight, a lot of them are doing it now or trying to, um, but that was what was really, you know, to your question, I, ha I have what I call this kind of this 30,000 foot view over the industry where I really had an accelerated learning curve where I could see a lot of different practices, ones that were growing, ones that were prospering, ones that weren't. And really, you know, we have a saying around here, success leaves clues. And it was taking some of the best practices and just sharing those among our group of advisors, like a real, like a mastermind you know, where, where you get a bunch of really smart, intelligent people trying to grow a practice that serves their clients at the highest level and just sharing best practices across the group. So long answer, but that's really where I've been living for the last decade plus um, a lot of conversations with a lot of amazing practices of which obviously you run one as well. 
Yeah, and how many advisors do you believe you have spoken to or coached over the years, worked with? Well, the the Gladwell, the Gladwell rule, ten thousand hours, which I know some people agree with, some people don't. Um, I I have to have put in twenty thousand hours plus. I mean, basically all day, every day, I'm on, for the most part, coaching calls, either Zooms, conversations like this, where it's a video. Um, back in the day, it was over the phone, and then you know advisors would be faxing me their paperwork. So that, that kind of shows you where I started at, how long ago that was, but thousands and thousands yeah. of hours at this point and hundreds of advisors for sure. Yeah. I, I think it's just an amazing position uh, that you're sitting in that people get to uh, lean on and kind of see behind the curtain, as we've said over and over again uh, to our audience, how important that is to really understand what's going on back there. And I think this is just a great jumping off point uh, to dive into one of our fan questions that we had come in, those individuals that sign up for our weekend reading emails, uh, an email that we send out every single Friday, a collection of four articles, uh, current retirement trends, we also invite them to ask our guest questions. And I think the question that we got here gives us a great lead in to, to just go in so many different ways. Um, this question comes from Janet Ryan. And Janet says, our financial advisor has never really given us a customized plan. Instead, he plugs our information into a um, they say the name of the firm that they're working with, a large brokerage firm. Uh, they plug that information, this large brokerage firm's program, and uses that as the plan. When we meet, he generally only talks about the stock market. My husband and I are both 61 and realize we probably need someone more strategic. What are the most important attributes we should be looking for? And how do you identify the person who can help on a more customized basis? And I'll just, let's start with that first one what are the most important attributes we should be looking for or you take it any way you want what, what kind of advice would you give someone like this Janet you know what, what would you t say to Janet Ryan um, at this point in their lives and what they're going through so this is such number one an am amazing question um, and there are so many places we can go with this one so I'm gonna I think I'm gonna start with an analogy um, and then we'll see where we want to take it from there but so the first thing that you start to, you need to start to think about when you go into a financial advisor's office is do they have access to all of the tools? And so I'm going to use the analogy of building a home um, because it, I think Janet said customized or some sort of customized plan. I didn't write down the word. Right. But customized basically, plan or something more strategic. Yes. Yeah, strategic. So strate strategic around her and her husband, customized, built for them. She mentioned they just kind of plug something into a website and then they talk about stocks, right? So here's, this was the first big eye-opening moment early in my career. Um, I assumed that when you walk into a financial advisor's office, it was similar to walking into a doctor's office, right? And so let's say my elbow hurts immediately. I think most individuals, Oh, worst case scenario, you know, what's, you know, what's screwed up. Do I have cancer? And some people just freak out. It's honestly not that different than how a lot of people think about their finances, right? There, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty. So you walk into this doctor's office, your elbow hurts a great doctor. What's the first thing they're going to do? Do they reach over and grab the prescription pill bottle and say, here you go. This is our best prescription. Everybody takes this one i.e., do they tell you about their favorite stocks? No. A great doctor asks a lot of questions. They diagnose. They figure out the symptoms, right? Where, where's your elbow hurt? Show me. How long does it hurt? Were you doing something that caused it to hurt? Um, when they are there any activities pressure. where it keeps hurting, right? <laughs> yeah, check your blood pressure maybe. Um, and so they would take a lot of time asking questions, diagnosing, figuring out the symptoms, and maybe immediately they're like, oh, I've seen this a hundred times before. They write you a prescription, you go you know, to your local pharmacy and you fill the prescription. Or if it's a complex situation, you look at serious medical issues, they're gonna take the time to actually sort through and diagnose and look at x-rays and all of these other things. And then they're gonna get back to you. They're gonna call you back into their office. So long answer to Janet here. 
But that's the way a great financial advisor works. What they do, um, I just did a podcast with Carl Richards and he said, he summed it up beautifully. He said, your clients don't come in speaking to financial advisors, right? Your clients don't come in for products. They come in because of their problems. No different than you go into a doctor's office. You don't just show up to a doctor's office. Hey, I wanted to hang out for an hour. You go in because there's issues, concerns you have around your health. They ask you a lot of questions and a great doctor thoroughly diagnoses you and then gives you the best medicine to fix the problem. Very similar to a financial advisor. So if you're going into a financial advisor's office and they're immediately leading with their favorite product, whether that's an annuity, whether that's a life insurance policy, whether that's their favorite asset manager, oh, everybody, this is the tactical asset management that we use because it's the best. Without asking a lot of questions and thoroughly diagnosing you, I would walk out of the office and I would go somewhere else. That's just me being honest and real. (laughs) So what do you think that experience should look like when you're first meeting with a financial advisor for the first time? What should you be hoping for specifically in that visit? And are there red flags for you? Okay. Outside of them just saying, you know, this is the best product to for us to use and diving right into the product, not asking the right question. What other things might you look for during that first visit? Or what would you hope to get out of that first visit if you were looking for a financial advisor, Brad? As the prospective client, I think there's a great rule. You should do most of the talking on the first visit. So if you find that the advisor is... 75% of the conversation, 90% of the conversation, going back to how do you diagnose somebody if you're not asking them questions, right? So a lot of our clients will name that first visit to the office. They'll call it a discovery session because that's what it should be. It should be a lot of questions. And if you're not getting asked a lot of questions in the first visit, how do they know your individual situation? Um, I'll I'll compare it to kind of analogy we use a lot in our coaching is it's kind of like building a home. Building a financial plan has a lot of similarities to building a home. So I'll go back to Janet. Basically, the home she was being built was, it reminds me of those neighborhoods you see in big cities where you drive around the neighborhood and every house is the identical, right? They've got the same blueprint and literally it's like, build it, okay build it. And they're just like hammering out neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so basically if she's going in, something's getting plugged into a computer and 30 minutes later, boom, here's your plan. There's no customization going on there. It's just little, like these little box houses that they're just building one after the other. Right. So basically they're selling the same thing to everyone essentially. Um, So flip that to, if you were going to build a custom home, you would sit down with an architect. You would say, Um, well, we've been saving up for our dream home. We've got the land picked out. It's over here. And then they'd say, okay, cool. Um, well, tell me about the structure. What's that look like? Well, we want a ranch. Um, we love ranches. We love the way those lay out. We want vaulted ceilings. We want a super open kitchen because we want to entertain there. Um, we want a great big deck because we love to barbecue. And by the way, we've got grandkids. We want a cool pool area. We want to entertain out there. We want all kinds of these family moments to be able to be experienced out there. Right. And so essentially you would paint a picture of this structure. What is the purpose of it existing and how is it going to serve you and create moments, right? And emotions and family and experience. And they wouldn't be able to plug into a computer all of this and 30 minutes later, here's your blueprint. They would have to take a lot of notes, actually go think this out and conceptually build it on whatever software they use to build it. And then they'd call you back in and you'd talk about this at a high level. And they'd say, what do you think, Casey? Is this, are we going down the right path here? Or, and you'd say, yeah, we love that, but change this, change that. And that's a lot like an amazing financial plan or the, or the best financial plans is there's a lot of questioning up front. And then no different than a home, a a great financial plan, it's built to serve you. Money is just a tool. So how do we deploy this tool to create experiences 
in retirement that you want. More time with the grandkids. Checking off bucket list trips. That's what retirees, from my experience, typically want. They want, how do I remove the anxiety where I know I can buy that plane ticket once a year, go visit my son that moved half a country over, and he's got three little grandbabies that I want to make sure I see at a minimum for at least a week a year. And I don't want to think about it. I don't want to have, have anxiety around buying a plane ticket. I just want to know it's built right into my plan. And I, it's like clockwork, right? So once again, I'm giving you really long answers yeah. here, but I want to paint a picture because I think sometimes people like this world of finance, it's overwhelming. It creates anxiety. There's conflicting headlines all over the news or whatever website you're on. And sometimes they forget to just simplify it. Money's a tool. Utilize that tool, deploy that tool to create the experiences in retirement that you seek out and bring you happiness and joy. Um, and then just make sure you're working with somebody that understands what you're trying to accomplish. You know, yeah. Stephen Covey, start with the end in mind. They need to know where they're going and then no financial plan's perfect because nobody can predict the market. But it's like, it's like GPS, if you take a wrong turn, it's going to redirect you back on the path, assuming the advisor knows where you're going and you know where you're going. So right. that to me is an amazing financial plan. And you can't just snap your fingers, plug it in a website. And 15 minutes later, here's your plan. It has to be custom yeah. built because every retiree is a little different. Well, I love what you said. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there. Even the, the whole experience thing. I mean, focusing on the experiences you ultimately want to get out of this. That takes some time. That takes somebody really asking the right questions and getting to know you. We had George Kinder of the Kinder Institute on a previous episode, and he said, you know, you, you cannot fulfill your role as a fiduciary advisor with the legal responsibility mm -hmm. to, to do the best thing for your clients if you don't really know what drives them, what those passions are, what those experiences are that they're ultimately looking for. And I think that's that's so true. And I love the whole house analogy. You know, it I think there's a time in your life when you need that box home. You need that spec yeah. home. I mean, for for my wife and I, we lived in one apartment. We lived in another apartment. We lived in another apartment. And then we moved into a spec home. And then you know, a couple of years ago, we bought our dream home. And when we did that, we didn't just walk in. We didn't even just fill out a piece of form, a form and send it in to our architect. We had an amazing architect that we sat down with. We explained, as you did, well, you know, we want the living room to be the largest space. We want to be able to be in the kitchen and playing with the kids all at the same time. We want to, you know, have a small bedroom because you know, we would just sleep there. We don't need a massive bedroom. Make it as small as possible. Make it cozy. You know, make it for us. And you know, that architect got really spent a lot of time not just asking us what we wanted out of the home, which I think sometimes we meet with a financial advisor, we tell them, well, we want to make 6% a year, we want $6,000 a month in income, you know, but but it, it's more than that. You know, with him, it wasn't just him saying, well, okay, well, that's what you want, this is what you're going to get. It was, well, let me meet your kids. How many kids are you going to have? How long are you going to live in this home? What kind of experiences do you, I mean, who's really asking those types of questions? You don't really expect even an, an architect you know, to ask you for that matter. And we did most of the talking. I think that's one of your greatest points there is, you know, you should do most of the talking during that first visit. Don't let that, if that advisor's just puffing his chest, beating his chest and doing all the talking, then it's probably another good reason to move on. You've explained what you expect that first visit to look like. Now I wonder what's it look like as we progress? I know one of the things you work with and coach advisors through is how that meeting structure should look like from first appointment to, to ultimately becoming a client and then setting up some type of review schedule. What do you think that uh, relationship progression should, should look like? So we, yeah, we went pretty deep on the first visit. So call that a discovery session. So they're asking a lot of questions and I'll use the, I'll keep bouncing back and forth between the doctor, right? Because I think everybody understands a doctor's appointment. So that's like the, the first time you go in and see a doctor and they ask you about your symptoms and start to diagnose and understand the issue, right? So that's the first visit. The second visit, uh, a lot of our offices will call this kind of an overview session. and Let's go back to the architect because I think this this is a great analogy. So you sat down with the architect, you told them what's your dream home, all of the different pieces of the puzzle, right? They would come back to a second visit and now the blueprint is drawn. 
okay? And this is first take. So this is a rough draft. This is not the final plan. And I think that's another thing, a tip I would give the listeners is one thing you need to remember, this is your money. This is not the advisor's money. So in the end, you have full control and decision. But to your point, as you were mentioning the architect you work with, Casey, um, he had done this enough times. He was seeing things that you never thought of, right? Like, let me meet your children. How many do you plan on having? Oh, so this home is going to need to go through little kid stage all the way through big kid stage, right? Yeah. And a great financial advisor that's Astro built, main, right? Plans, <laughs> right. It, and, uh, that's built a lot of these plans will know, oh, okay, so you're 60. So this plan is going to need to evolve, you know, 85, 90 years old. And so in that second visit, what it should look like is it should be a simplistic view. Simplistic is the key here. Great advisors simplify the complex. You should not walk out of an advisor's office on, after that second visit and have a laundry list of questions that you wrote down on a piece of paper that you need to go research. Um, and, you know, go, go do Google like you're writing a college paper. And what it should look like is it should go back to the problems. It should be very problem focused and say a common problem we see. Do I have enough, right? A lot of retirees, they work, they go through their working years. And those are the years where honestly, those box plans, it's not necessarily bad. Like their guy helped them through those accumulation years, which was stash some money away, every paycheck, put it in the 401k, whatever their saving vehicle was to where someday literally I've made it right. I can retire. I can put in my two weeks. I kind of compare that to you've, you've climbed Mount Everest. You're now at the peak and you're standing there with the flag and you're victorious, right? Well, the issue is that's only half the battle. The other half of the battle is how the heck do I get back down the mountain now? And so for retirees, we call this the distribution phase, right? So going back to the number one problem, a lot of retirees, they're looking at their 401k. It's a million dollars, $2 million, whatever they've stashed away. And they're like, everything was done for me to this point. You know, I just had to show up to work. It auto fed into my 401k, the paycheck showed up in the bank account. I just had to pay my bills, show up to work, and pretty much everything else was on autopilot, right? Well, now they've retired. It's time for the distribution phase where now that million dollar nest egg has to last them the rest of their life. That's where anxiety creeps in, right? Uh Uh-oh, how do I do that? I have no clue. And so that's why that number one concern a lot of times we hear is, do I have enough? Is this million dollars enough? how much can I spend? I don't want to overspend and run out of money and have to move in with my kids. But at the same time, I don't want to underspend. And now I die with a million bucks in the bank that I never got to take the trips that I wanted to take. Right. So going back to appointment two, a great advisor will say, Hey, I noticed the last time we got together, Joe and Mary, your biggest concern at the end of the day, and you know, we kind of talked this through and it was kind of like a family counseling session, which is what a lot of these meetings turn into. And your number one concern was, Joe, you wanted to make sure no matter what happens, Mary's taken care of when you're gone. And I know it's been a week since the last time we got together. And I'm sure you've had some conversations since then. I just want to check back in. Is that still the absolute number one concern you have that we're trying to make sure we solve for as we build your financial plan? And Joe's going to look at Mary and he's going to say, Yeah, that's my number one concern. Okay, great. Well, I'm excited because I've had my team working here and we haven't built the full plan because you haven't asked us to. So going back to the architect, right? He's just built the blueprint, which is a high level 30,000 foot overview of the structure. He hasn't picked out the granite countertops yet. That's way too far. So if that advisor now is going, I've got my favorite annuity, I've got my favorite asset manager in that second visit. Be careful because at that point, it's structural. It's simplistic. It's, is this the problem we're solving for? And our very best offices to go back to simplifying the complex, they're slowing down. They're taking their time. They're educating their clients. Hey, we've got two or three strategies we typically use to solve for this income gap. And here's kind of where you are today. Here's the before. I'm using my, for those on video, my my props here. Here's the before picture in my left hand. And here's what we think 
could be the after picture. Now we don't know yet because we ha I haven't put my team to work and it's going to take a few hours to custom build this plan for you, just like it would to custom build a blueprint for a home. But I want to make sure, are we going down the right path here? Does this, this is where you're at today, but this is where you said you want to be over here. Does that make sense? Are we, are we going down the right path? Yeah, that's exactly the path. So kind of this before and after snapshot, like an infomercial, right? You've got, look at how every piece of exercise equipment, I think in the history of the world has been sold. You've got this typically middle-aged guy that's overweight, super grumpy and horrible lighting. That's the before picture, right? And then they're like, oh, buy our Bowflex. And then here's the after picture. Six months later, six pack abs, like super confident, chest puffed out. That's what I think a great second visit should look like. It should be, here's your current situation. And you said you have issues with that, right? You said you had a problem with that. Now we haven't built your plan yet because you haven't asked us to, but looking at two or three common strategy we, strategies we've used in other financial plans and other retirees that had that same issue, here's approximately where we think we could get you to. Is that look about right? Are we solving, would you be confident in a plan like that if we were able to do that for you? And confirming that, and if that's a yes, okay, great. Once the commitment's made, which is typically where most clients are gonna say, okay, yes, build the plan for me. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that's like hiring the architect. Okay, I'm hiring you, or maybe the general contractor would be a better way to put it if you're building a home. Hey, architect, get with the general contractor, it's time to break ground. So most of our offices at the end of that second visit, once they've kind of done the 30,000 foot view, that's when they're gonna engage in the plan, either pay the fee for the plan, move the assets to engage uh, the plan, whatever that office, how they kind of put the plan into action. That's typically mm -hmm. where they would take it from. There. And I think there's a big difference there. I think as far as you're saying, you haven't picked out the granite yet, right? I, I think you know, when, when you typically build a custom home, you're kind of picking some of those things along the way. You know, it's, it's not, we're going to pick out the exact flooring. We're going to pick out the granite countertops. We're going to pick out the cabinet manufacturer. And, and we don't know every little thing, and every detail. When we start building that home, it develops over time. Once we've really figured out what we're working with and where we want to go. Now, I want to make sure that we don't miss out on, I, I can just hear Janet right now going, hey, answer my question. You, know, you, you told me, you know, really what I should be looking for as far as you know what that first visit should look like what that advisor should be doing how the plan should be built how that experience should go however i think most people are going yeah but how do i find that individual uh, how do i recognize the difference between someone that's just going to throw me into a spec home versus building out a custom house and i i this is this is for me one of the most frustrating things in our industry is it's nearly impossible to tell what one financial advisor specializes in over what another financial advisor specializes in. I mean, my own family, I, I think they're just now figuring out what I do, right? I mean, how many you know, years have we been going on? My wife, uh, her family, you know, we get married and, you know, I'm telling somebody what I do and they go, oh yeah, Casey's a, a financial advisor. You know, he just, he just, uh, he, or Casey, you know, sales investments and it's like, no right. no that's wrong that's what your guy does yeah. i do something completely different but i think all advisors in general they get lumped into one bucket and they all look the same so if you're going to say janet okay this is how you find someone that's going to build you a customized plan uh in a strategic way what would you say to that mm. and these are these are simple questions with big answers and as we were getting started for this interview, we did a little pre-interview and I said, you know, I want to be raw. I want to ask some really hard questions. I've gotten some really hard questions lately yeah. and I want to tackle them. Yeah, no, I, I love that we're going here because it would be overwhelming. As a, I can't imagine being a retiree out there right now if I hadn't grown up in this industry and kind of had, you know, you see the saying, you see how the sausage is made, right? And most retirees have never had that experience. So I can just imagine the anxiety and the, the unknowns out there. And even being in this industry, it is almost impossible. Like, how, how do you know this individual is a good financial advisor? Because so much of our industry is around how you market yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's, let's go back 
to the home building. We're just going to kill this analogy. <laughs> and we're going to run it straight into the ground today. Um, so let's let's just say I'm I, I'm presenting right, and I go over here on the left hand side, and I say, hey, I'm the financial advisor for you. Um, we build amazing homes, and you know you're going to love them. And Janet's like, oh, sounds good, Brad. I think I, I want to build a home with you. And then right as she's getting ready to sign on the dotted line to engage my services, right? I say, hey, Janet, one quick thing before we get started. I just want you to know the way we build our homes, um, we, we've got this thing, we don't use hammers. So I want to make sure you're okay with that. And Janet's like, what? Like, how are, how are you going to nail the boards together without a hammer and nail gun? You know, something to take a nail and put it, put it through two boards to pin them together. Well, we just use saws. You know, we, we found a way to construct the house. We don't use hammers. We only use saws. Okay. You're never going to sign up with that home builder. You're like, this guy's crazy or this gal's crazy. I see it all day, every day in financial services. You know, they might be just insurance license and nothing against that individual. There's a lot of great insurance focused advisors out there. But if you're looking to build a holistic plan, a full like home, right? In this analogy, you want all the tools in the toolbox. So that might be one side, right? Here's somebody that's just insurance focused. They're not security licensed. You go over to the other side of the stage. So Janet goes, she's, Janet's like, uh, forget that guy. I, that's a little out there. I think you need a hammer if you're going to build a home. So she goes over to this other office, right? And this guy's like, oh, I build beautiful homes. Oh. Janet's ready to sign up. Real quick before you do though, Janet, we don't use saws in our construction. Huh? Like you don't use any, no, anything that cuts a board in two, we just don't believe in it. It's, it's just not how our company runs. Well, in this analogy, that's a lot of fee-only advisors, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. crazy. I, I wouldn't have believed this until I started a podcast for financial advisors and I've connected with a lot of them there's financial advisors out there that manage 500 million plus a billion plus of assets, not insurance licensed. Yeah. So, you know, the saying, and this is cliche, but it works with the analogy to a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. Yeah, I said this happens so much. I just had a conversation service. recently. I've got to interject as I, I had a conversation recently with a, a local, um, it was an insurance broker, uh, mainly focused on long-term care sales, mm -hmm. uh, called us and he talked to me on the phone for a long time. One of the things he said was, uh, I, he said, I'm not securities licensed. I don't do any, um, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. He said, I don't believe that someone, once they reach retirement age, should have any money at risk. And so, and Okay. And and then at the other end of the extreme, I think what you're saying, it's like you've got individuals out there that will say the opposite, you know, and these are typically your, you know, local brokers that are securities only or have very limited access to insurance products. And they'll say, oh, you know, we don't believe, we believe you have to have all your money in the market when you get to yeah. retirement. Interest rates are too low. You have to have everything in the market. We don't believe yeah. in life insurance. Without, without it in the market, it's not going to keep up with inflation <laughs> through, you know, through your 20 yeah. years retirement. So if that's the key, if we're trying to find someone that is, um, you know, has all these different tools, how do we recognize that person? Where do we go to find that person? That's, you know, I, most people don't know what a series 65 or a series 66, yeah. seven, a, a life, a health annuity license, you know, what, what type of licensing should they have? Where do we find out what kind of licenses they have? It's so hard to read through all yeah. the marketing Pardon yeah, I, there should be I'm yes, just, it's out there. I'm trying to think, Casey, like if I'm a retiree, what's the most simplistic way to do this? I think it's an open dialogue. Yeah, it's it's number one, you can check licensing websites, right? So you can check to see if an individual is insurance licensed. You can also check broker checks, uh, a good way where you can check to see if the individual you're working with um, is securities licensed and what what securities uh, licenses they hold. So to your point, a series 65 allows an advisor to charge a fee to manage your assets, which is uh, really the trend we've seen in the industry, especially the last 10 years, where um, it's kind of like you and the advisor on the same same team, right? 
they, they charge a fee on your assets as your assets grow, they benefit, you benefit, right? So, but I also think it's an open dialogue with the advisor because a lot of advisors have these biases. They don't even know they have them. It's insane to me, but I've been in so many of these conversations because it's, think about like, if you grew up and you were raised in a Christian family, well, obviously you're probably Christian and your bias goes towards being a Christian. And that's great, right? That's, that's the core of who you are. It, it's your identity. It's no different in financial services. If somebody got into, came into the business and they were trained in an insurance focused firm where they were basically taught insurance is good, everything else is bad. It's really hard to untrain that. And a lot of advisors look through this lens of this world where that's just how it is. On the flip side, if they came in to some brokerage firm where they were just taught, I just manage assets, the stock, only the stock market is good. Everything else is bad. Commissions are bad. You should never do anything commission-based. Well, now they're looking through a very different lens. From my experience, retirees don't care. What they want is like going back to the tool analogy. I want to know Casey and his team of advisors have this massive toolbox sitting at their feet full of all of these financial tools, every single one in the world, because as a fiduciary, which is a term that gets thrown around a lot in our industry, and unfortunately, it's become a marketing term now. Um, but as a fiduciary, the, the definition is Casey and his team are legally obligated to do what's in your best interest. Well, how do you do that if you only have half the tools in the toolbox and you've eliminated half of the financial tools in the world? Are you like, I'm a fiduciary with only half the options? To <laughs> me, the best advisors, I would ask them, in that first visit, as a fiduciary, do you have access to all of the tools out there? And I would probably say, can you manage my assets for a fee? Can you offer insurance products like life insurance, annuities, that would create income streams or help with wealth transfer um, when it's all said and done? And I would probably go down a list of a handful of of different options, different tools. And I'd say, what are your thoughts? How do you feel about that? Have you used those in other plans? And I would interview them a little bit because you should, it's a really important decision. But um, yeah, I could, I could stay very passionate and down this topic, but to me, it's always beneficial to the retiree, to the client to have more options rather than less and making sure that that advisor takes the time to thoroughly research all the options mm -hmm. back to our analogy on hammer and saw what's the most efficient tool to get the job done, right? And all of these biases, there's bad mutual funds, there's bad annuities, there's bad asset managers. So if you've read an article that says annuities are bad, life insurance is bad, mutual funds are bad, it's probably a marketing piece by an advisor that sells the other thing. So mm -hmm. be very cautious when you're clicking on headlines because the truth is there's good and ba bad products in every single different financial tool. And the best advisors will thoroughly research and say, hey, here's the best in class that actually serve your need here and most efficiently fix that. I'll wrap here. Going back to the nest egg, standing on the top of Mount Everest, a great advisor is not going to say, hey, you have a million bucks. Let's put 999000 into an annuity. You're set for life now. Well, they just over allocated to a tool, right? Most likely without knowing an individual financial situation, because most advisors are going to say, hey, you've got this million dollar nest egg. Let's carve out enough over here to solve for that income gap. So regardless of what the market does, bull market, bear market, up, down, sideways market, you can always spend with confidence because you've now created your own form of a pension like income driven off of, I mean, look at social security. It's just another word for an annuity that the government pays you, right? So I think the key is taking the most efficient tool to solve the need, but there shouldn't be an over allocation. It should be a nice balance across multiple tools to get the job done. Mm -hmm.
Well, and that really goes back to our planning philosophy, you know, which is the purpose-based retirement. You know, we're looking at the need, right? If if your your goal is, well, you say, I don't need any income. You know, I need to have growth and I'm going to need this to grow 20 years from now. I'm going to need income. Well, then why would you put it all on annuities? You know, it should probably be in the market because it's going to need to grow for the next 20 years. If you say, well, I don't need it at all, then maybe it should be set aside for legacy purposes. Purposes. Maybe a large portion could be in life insurance or uh, offering long-term care protection. You know, we should be looking at multiple different tools to solve whatever that need is. Is it for income? Is it for long-term growth? Is it for long-term care? Is it for legacy purposes? Is this your emergency fund? Um, and getting to that end point, point B, in the most efficient way possible. And I think at, uh, one of the things that's unique about Advisors Excel and the individuals that you're coaching, I'm thinking of this you know, you, you guys are offering all those different tools from Medicare, long-term care, life insurance, annuities, securities. You've got all those different tools and you only work with independent advisors. And so would one of the keys to finding uh, an individual who can offer a truly customized plan have all of those tools? Do they have to be independent in order to accomplish that? And um, if that is the case, they need to be independent. How do you recognize one advisor that's independent and one that is not independent? I mean, I have heard captive advisors say, mm -hmm. we are an independent advisory practice of right. blah, blah, blah. And they're not independent. They're still working for a brokerage firm. What is an independent advisor? Is that important? Yeah, uh, very. So, and I'm just going back through all these conversations I've had over the years. I'm not going to throw stones at anyone on this, but I'll just say I've talked with advisors from very large broker dealers um, that would be very recognizable. And it goes back to if, so let's go back to this, the beginning of this question, independent advisor. How do you identify that? Well, if you can, first thing you can do is you can go to a financial advisor's website, scroll all the way down to the bottom and there will be a disclosure at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. the That's tiny, huge. The tiny <laughs> little type. Yeah. yeah you know, the tiny That's how I do it. Every time I, I hear a new advisor come on the radio or TV or somebody new in town and say, I wonder if this guy is independent. Because yeah, it's, it's impossible to tell. Unless you go to the website, you scroll all the way down. Like you said, look at that fine print. Yeah. So, so go down to the bottom. And it's going to say this representative is he's a registered representative of XYZ company. And if you can search for that company and they're publicly traded, just know they can say they're independent, but what do publicly traded companies, who do they serve? Shareholders, right? So even though they may have a lot of options, what you're going to be looking at is they work for a firm that serves shareholders. Shareholders want profit, right? Um, so as an independent, the difference is Casey, the entrepreneur created a firm and he's added advisors to the team. And what that looks like is Casey's obviously he is in a for-profit business, so he's going to also run a profitable business, but the only people he really has to serve to do that are his clients. Like you've got to serve your clients at the highest level, because guess what? If you do a great job. They're going to refer, refer more people. They're going to tell others about you and you're going to grow a firm uh, rapidly by doing that, right? So I think what's really interesting is some of the largest firms out there, when I have behind the scenes conversations on the phone with advisors that work with these, there's frustrations because we offer essentially every annuity under the sun in the United States of America in the fixed space, right? And pretty much every life insurance policy, because we're a very large brokerage company, so we've got access to a lot of products. And there will be frustration from these advisors that work with what I would captive firms, right? They're like, that's an awesome product. I want to offer that to my clients. I'm like, sorry, your, your group does not allow that. It's not on their approved product list. So their clients, without even knowing it, don't have access to one of the best products in or the best tools right that exists out there to serve that need but they don't even know because it's never on the menu for them because their firm hasn't approved it right and mm -hmm. so that's that's the beauty of independence um it's kind of like if i was shopping for laundry detergent 
I could go to Quick Shop. I'd probably pay twice as much and they'd have Tide and that's about it, right? They've got the product on the shelf, but they've got limited selection. Or I could go to Walmart and look down the aisle and there's like a whole, I mean, as almost as far as a football field, there's a shelf of laundry, laundry detergent as far as the eye can see. To me, that's a, a great analogy of the difference between kind of a captive organization versus an independent because as an independent, if Casey sees a product that he wants to offer, he can put it on the shelf. It might only get one sale a year for that one client that needs that specific thing, but it can sure sit on the shelf, no problem. He's got plenty of shelf space. So to me, that's right. the difference. The easiest way for most of your listeners to go and check that out. Go to the very bottom and uh, you'll you'll be able to see also broker check is another way. And if they're big name firms, just know that they're they're technically a captive advisor that has probably limited options from my experience. Yeah, I like the one thing you said, you know, if there's that one client out of 100 in any given year uh, that needs that particular product, and they're the only one out of 100 that needs that particular tool, then you have the ability to get licensed and offer that tool just for that one individual. And you know, um, you know, I am licensed with dozens and dozens of different carriers. And that is, uh, that can be quite burdensome. I feel like I'm getting licensed with a new carrier <laughs> every three to five days. Yeah. And it's uh, a full-time job just to stay licensed. I mean. <laughs> so, you know, there's something I want to go back to though, uh, which you mentioned the word team um, when you were talking about uh, working with an advisor and going through that process in that second visit. Hey, it's going to take us a while to finalize uh, and finish the build as our team's going to put in a lot of hours on this. And uh, that word team might be a unique thing to some people. I know when I first got started, um, it was just myself for the longest time. It was just myself and one assistant. And then uh, we added another advisor. And I look back at that and I go, wow, I can't believe people hired me as just this one guy, right? I mean, what what if something happens to me or, you know, what other opinions So, how much value are they getting just out of me? You know, I think I'm a pretty smart guy, but there's other pretty smart guys too and gals. And I think a team approach is so much more value. You get so much more input from other individuals. I just, you know, if, if you think a team approach is the right thing to do, um, how, how big does that team need to be in order to deliver the right degree of confidence um, to the client? Uh, what should that team look like? So yeah, on the, on the team front, one of, our, one of our advisors that has built a substantial firm on the East Coast, Joel, who obviously you've spent some time with, yeah. um, he has this little thought process, kind of a, a question he'll ask a lot of our advisor. He's like, what happens to your business tomorrow if you're walking across the street and you get hit by a bus? And there's a lot of aspects to that. Number one, what happens to Casey's family if there's not a business in place, right? You want to make sure your wife and children are taken care of. So there's the aspect from the advisor standpoint. Then there's the aspect from your client standpoint. If Casey's the sole guy and he gets hit by a bus, what happens? Like the door's shut basically, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think for most of our, what I would say, top tier offices, they do look at a team-based approach because it delivers more value to the client and it's creating a business. You know, we, we do a lot of coaching where you want to transition from financial advisor to CEO. And because if Casey sits in the CEO seat, which I know you've done a lot of work on transitioning to leading a team, right? Running a company, culture, all of that that goes into a great business. Because now you can exponentially deliver more value to your clients. It's kind of like McDonald's, right? Why can McDonald's have a hamburger that tastes the same? You can buy it. My kids, you know, we're in Prague and they're like, can we go to McDonald's, dad? I'm like, oh my gosh, I failed as a parent, right? But <laughs> hey, the hamburger tastes good Sometimes in Prague. Sometimes you just need a cheeseburger. The same, the same way the hamburger tastes the same in Prague as it does in Kansas, right? Well. That's because they've created a process that is so systematic and so dialed in that an 18-year-old kid can run it from the front of the store. So what I see a lot of our offices spend a lot of time in purpose-based retirement. 
you've taken the time, you've taken the training, you're a CFP. I know that's a big thing for your team. You want to continue to have a CFP standard internally for all of your advisors. So you've educated yourself on how is a proper financial plan built. And now you've created a system internally where you walk your advisors through how to build the plan the same way to a high standard every time. It's not that different than McDonald's, right? So McDonald's, I'm not saying McDonald's has the best hamburger, but they deliver the same product over and over and over. And so the, the beauty of that is if Casey gets hit by a bus, guess what? There's a team of advisors that know how to build the hamburger the same way in this analogy. Mm -hmm. right? And so now the next question is, how big is your dream as the CEO, as the advisor? How many people do you want to serve? What's your vision? Do you want this legacy company that's going to change America? And like, I want... I want like a McDonald's, it's on every street corner, right? So the next thing is how big is big, big enough? The question I think really comes back to the advisor, how many people do you want to serve? And how good is the hamburger, right? Mm -hmm. McDonald's had to have a, a good enough hamburger where people demanded it, they wanted it. So that's why there's a franchise in every little city, right? So if the recipe is right, where you're adding value to the clients, and now you've got a systematic process. Well, as I know, you've created, you've opened a second location, right? And so now you've franchised, you've created your second McDonald's franchise so you can serve more people. And now you've got a well-trained staff that's manning the second location to deliver the same experience, right? So once you've really done all the work, they're really, the sky's the limit. I mean, there's, there's very large financial institutions in the United States of America that you, you see a lot of locations. And, and one thing we talked before we went live, Casey, that I think is worth sharing here because you're doing it. And I, I love that you're doing it. Um, the future of financial advice, to me, we're very brick and mortar still right now. Most retirees are like, oh, I'm going to go down to my local financial advisor's office. Well, look at how technology has changed everything for us. I mean, my dad and mom are ordering off Amazon now. They're shipping my eight-year-old son's present directly to our house. Because they're like, well, I used to have to drive down to Walmart and then, you know, cart it in the back of my car when we drove to your house. I'll just deliver it there. That's easier, right? So technology has allowed brick and mortar. Honestly, that's why Walmart's struggling because Amazon's eating their lunch right now. It's a better experience. So the future of financial advice to me, you will not work with your local financial advisor you'll work with the best financial advisor. And just like we're, we're recording this conversation, I'm in Kansas, you're in Indiana, it's virtual. It feels like we're face-to-face. -face. You'll click a button once this is all edited up. And now you've just syndicated this conversation worldwide. You can serve clients the same way, right? You can pop up a Zoom like this with anybody in the United States of America. And I know that's where it's going. It's just going to have to, it took a while for my mom and dad to be comfortable ordering off Amazon. It had to, there was this tipping point. You're on the leading edge of that. And I love that you're putting the work into taking all of these different conversations that can serve retirees, because to me, that is the future of financial advice. People will seek out the knowledge and the people they best connect with, their methodologies, their philosophies with money. It won't be a local financial advisor in the future, in mm -hmm. my opinion. I think that's a pretty cool thing. I, we've got families that we're now working with in Alaska and Hawaii, California, uh, Massachusetts, Florida, you know, just all over the country. And I think it's just a matter of time before it's, well, now it's Mexico and Central America and Europe. And That'll you know, be like, really interesting when someday it will be there. I wonder when. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so I was just out at Pebble Beach. Um, my buddy Derek, who, who you know, had a 40th yeah. birthday. And Pebble Beach was the most amazing experience. We were at the, the inn at Spanish Bay. You will meet the most eclectic mix of people. Just literally, I think we were, I was having a glass of wine. The next thing I know, I'm talking to a group of like 15 guys from Australia. They were like 60 years old. And they had a buddy's trip. They'd kept going every year since college or university, as they call it, <laughs> right? And I was talking to this guy, he's like, what do you do? And I was like, oh, you know, work with financial advisors and typically retirement products. And 
So he starts asking me, you know, what's the market going to do? Is it going to correct? I'm like, who knows? Nobody knows. And I was like, well, you know, the cool thing is our company works with a lot of options to where when the market does correct, they still generate income regardless of, and he's like, what's that called? And I'm like, oh, it's this type of annuity. And he's like, does that exist in Australia? And I'm like, I don't know, it should. And so it was really, it, I think the future is, yeah, hopefully someday these, these products that only exist in certain countries are, are worldwide and you can serve everyone because it's not just the people in the, the retirees in the United States of America that need help with a great financial plan. It's everyone that's of that age worldwide. Yeah. Yeah, such a cool thing as uh, the world evolves. You mentioned, so you, looking for the great advisor, right? We, we've addressed a lot from Janet. I, I hope Janet's Janet started had a great question. Here. It lasted us like 60 minutes. <laughs> and so you talked about licensing. Let's make sure that the advisor you're working with is securities license and insurance license. They can handle your long-term growth. They can handle your uh, risk mitigation uh, due to that. Then you said, you know, make sure they're independent. So they've got the right licensing they're independent so that they have all the tools at their disposal and then make sure they're utilizing those tools so they're building a comprehensive plan they're not just focusing on investment they're not just focusing on income planning or long-term care they're focusing on that big picture now the next i know you and i discussed this you get to see a lot of different advisors uh, that came from a lot of different places with uh, totally different backgrounds education you know for me i think one of my biggest concerns for our industry is the lack of hurdles uh, it takes to actually get into the business of offering financial advice. It's not like being an attorney or a doctor. Um, what, what type of education level or what type of education should we be looking for if we're working with a financial planner? I think quite often it's just totally overlooked. And I know it was totally yeah. overlooked with my dad. My dad was, you know, in his sixties, he'd been fairly successful. Um, and he looked like he knew what he was talking about. And, and for the most part he did, he had a lot of experience, but yeah. he had zero education. Mm -hmm. but nobody ever asked. Yeah. It, it's, that's what's so tough is we have these blanket statements in our industry and there's such a wide spectrum of what that means. Um, financial advisor, what does that mean? How do you define it? Some people that aren't securities licensed call themselves financial advisors, right? Um, <laughs> I, I think, man, this is, it, this is the tough one. This is one our industry needs to fix because there isn't a standard. Um, I think the closest thing is a CFP. But on the flip side of that, I've talked with CFPs that weren't educated. You know, they got their CFP 20 years ago and they didn't stay up to speed on the new developments and, and the new planning opportunities uh, that were out there. So I really think as a retiree, here, here's probably the best way to do it. Going back to what Janet opened with, show me an example of a, a sample financial plan that you've built for other people you've helped. Because to me, if you're out there just selling products, what's gonna, what that's going to look like, or just managing assets, you're going to pop up your favorite annuity statement. You're going to say, oh, here's the plan we put in place. Or you're going to say, oh, here's this 50-page book prospectus of my favorite mutual fund or my favorite asset management. It's going to be very product-focused, where the people that are building holistic financial plans, what that's going to look like. They're going to pull out a binder or a lot of our offices are even, even starting to uh, transfer a binder that was a hard copy with papers that's kind of been the standard to an electronic version of that, uh, an electronic financial plan that's constantly updated based on market you know, updates every day. But I would say, hey, can you show me a sample of a plan or two that you've built for other individuals? Obviously, take their name off of it so it's not you're not sharing client info. Um, but help me understand how you build that plan and what that looks like. And, you know, maybe if it's somebody that has an income gap, like we do a strategy or two, but I'd ask for like a sample and it, because I know our, our top clients, however they grow their business, whether that's a radio show, obviously you've got one, whether that's public events where you speak to audiences, most times they're talking about how they build a plan, you know, purpose-based retirement in this instance. And a lot of times if they're at a live event, they're actually bringing a sample of it. They're like, hey, when we build the purpose-based retirement in 
world number one, we talk about liquidity or, you know, whatever those worlds consist of. Um, I think that's the best way is, you know, if you're building a home, hey, let's drive past a couple homes that you've already built. Let's walk through them and see what they look like. You're going to get a sense of the quality of the craftsmanship. No mm -hmm. different than if you're taking a drive through a couple plans that they've built, you're going to get a sense of the craftsmanship. Is it just a veiled product pitch or is it an actual holistic plan that they're building? Mm -hmm. well, that's great. You know, I, I don't want to, I know we're running out of time. So I just want to wrap up with a couple general questions. And uh, that first one, this, I guess this isn't too general because this is specific to you. Um, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. I have listened to every single episode that you've put out. I've uh, listened to some of them more than once. And I know a lot of other individuals that are big fans of the podcast so that have learned a lot from it. You've had over 60 interviews, I believe, with some of uh, today's brightest minds in the financial industry. What is your, what has been your biggest takeaway out of those 60 interviews? Mm. The one that immediately jumps out that I've shared it, it, literally a podcast that changed my life um, with a guy named Don Yeager. So Don has, he's a New York times bestseller. He wrote Walter Payton's biography just before he died, actually lived with Walter for a little bit as he was, um, on, you know, the, the last days of his life, uh, work done. So basically he has a really cool background, uh, was the former assistant editor at sports illustrated. So anyway, so, so we were having a conversation and he told me a story. Uh, he had been sent out to cover. So Shaquille O'Neal Shaq was a rookie in the league, I believe. So just, so when would that have been early two thousands probably. And he gets sent out. He finds out that Shaq and John Wooden, the famous UCLA coach, are doing like mentoring sessions. So Don flies out to cover it, Sports Illustrated, and they got the permission that they, he could sit in on one of these sessions. So Don's flying out and he's like, oh, I wonder what, you know, they're going to be talking about basketball and how to be successful and how to have a career. So he sits in on this. They don't talk about basketball at all. They talk about life parenthood, like stuff that really matters, like sage wisdom from John Wooden. And at the end of this interview, Don's just blown away. Like he's sitting there, like just soaking this all in. And he's like, wow, he was like called. And he, and, and he goes up to Wooden and he says, what would a guy like me have to do to mentor under a guy like you? And coach Wooden kind of like pauses. And this is like 90 some year old coach Wooden, right? Well, he'd have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Simple answer, right? So basically that kicked off this long time mentoring session. I think Don would fly out every couple months. And Wooden's rule was, this isn't like a buddy session. As long as you come to me with questions you want answered, I will set aside the time to spend time having a conversation. So that was what Don did. And so that went on for years. And towards the end of this conversation, Coach Wooden was getting old and Don was like, I just want to make sure if this is the last time I see him that I leave things in a great place and I show him gratitude for everything he's done for me. And so he says, hey, Coach Wooden, I just want you to know every time I leave your presence, I feel like I'm a better man. Most of us would say, oh, you know, that means a lot. I appreciate that. You know, I've loved these conversations as well. Coach Wooden says, you should make that your standard. And in that moment, it was powerful. But then when I rewound the conversation and like applied it to my own life, you know, we've all been idiots at certain times in our lives. You know, you look back at the college days and all that. And it made me reassess and say, you know, when I spend time with someone, do they leave a better person? Like, am I building them up? Or am I tearing them down? And I've definitely failed many times since then, right? Because I'm human. But it created a new standard that I try to live by to where whoever's paths I cross in this life, I want that experience to be a positive one. I want to add value to that experience um, because that's just who I want to be in life. And I just, that like little story from Don Yeager literally changed my perspective of how I view relationships with other people. Sure. And so that was like, 
my my best thing. And I pulled all kinds. I mean, when you have conversations with amazing, brilliant people that you aspire to be like in certain areas of your life, you pick up something from every conversation. But that was the one that immediately jumps out because it's continued to replay. And that conversation was years ago at this point. Well, I can tell that that's uh, definitely affected your life just in our interaction. We rarely have a conversation that is just surface level. We're just talking, well, how was the basketball game yesterday? Or did you see what happened on TV? Did you watch Netflix special? You know, it's usually much more meaningful than that. And I would have two takeaways, I think, from that for uh, those that are looking for an advisor or, you know, already in retirement, heading into retirement, I think one is that, uh, you know, we have to recognize all the experience that we have of 60 years, 70 years of life and entering retirement, those interactions that you're having with uh, other individuals uh, that are younger than you, uh, maybe they, that are even older than you, make sure you really recognize all that experience and try to offer that value in the form of asking really good questions. You would Wish you would have been asked, um, you know, when you were 20, 30, 40 years old, you have the, the opportunity to really change the world just out of utilizing that experience and asking the right questions. And I would also say, you know, as you're looking for an advisor, you, know, you said, you know, all he had to do was ask, right? All, all he had to do was ask, wouldn't it, if he could coach him. And I think, you know, it's difficult when you're looking for an advisor to figure out if you're working with the right person. The best way to do that is to ask the people that are already working with that individual. But you don't just want this select sample that the advisor handpicked his three clients out of 100 that would actually say something right. nice about him. You want to go to an event. And that's one of the things that as a fiduciary advisor, an investment advisor, unlike brokers, we're not allowed to offer references because you know we can hand select them. And instead, we hold large events, right? Try to find an advisor that's holding events of 100, 200, 300 people where they're working with all these different people and don't be afraid to ask. You know, money is this taboo subject, but most individuals can't wait to tell you about the experience they've had working with an advisor if it's been a great experience. Um, so those would be my two or, big Or if it's been a bad one. <laughs> Either way, they'll tell you. you know, right, so they're going to tell you. Yeah. Exactly. And if it's just okay, then maybe that's not the person you want to yeah. work with. Like, look for the extremes. Yeah. Uh, I've got one last question for you. And knowing that you are someone that specializes in working with uh, advisors that specialize in working with retirees, you're only working with retirement specialists. Um, you have been uh, coaching these advisors on retirement plans, retirement planning for many years. What does retirement mean to you? So I would define it the way I would define happiness. So happiness is lack of wanting to be anywhere else, experiencing anything else. So if you think about your happiest moments in life, it's like you were where you wanted to be, nowhere else in the world in that moment, right? And retirement to me is how many of those days can you string together in a row? And, and that might evolve. Yeah, I just got back from a, a trip to Europe with my family. So my wife, our three kids, so nine, eight, three. And we, we ended the trip with the Disney cruise. And I loved every moment. I love my family. But spend seven days in a Disney cruise cabin with three kids under 10, it'll, it'll test your love for people and your family, <laughs> right? But I, I came back and I was like, because I think the grass is always greener on the other side, right? And it's like, oh, I wonder if I could retire someday and just sail the world or hang out on the beach or whatever. And I missed what I did for a living. I was like, I'm ready to get back on the mic and do yeah. another podcast. I'm ready to do another coaching call. And so retirement, I think the old retirement where it was, you know, not the retirees of today. It was where you retired from that job. You had a pension and you sat on your front porch in the rocking chair and watched cars drive by. Like to me, retirement is if you love what you do, that's partially retirement right there because you're going into work, you're happy, you're fulfilled, you're adding value. And so to me, that's retirement. Like I'm partially retired today because I love what I do. And I like, I just want to throw some accolades back to you, Casey, because the way I see our industry and you're 
like what advisor sits down and prepares these like deep thought out questions to help random retirees around the world you've never met before, right? And I do a podcast, podcasts take money to produce, right? And the way I look at it is like, I'm in a position where I coach advisors, but those advisors in turn, you, there's this compound effect where you're now changing retirees' lives, helping them make decisions, navigating tough conversations they've often never even had with their own kids. And you're creating this compound effect. It doesn't just impact the retiree. It impacts their kids. A great financial plan is generational and their grandkids and allowing people to leave legacies behind. And what noble work. I mean, other than maybe a physician that, you know, make sure you're good, your health, or maybe your spiritual advisor that you're good there. What, what more noble profession than, than this industry done the right way. And so that, that is retirement to me. Happiness is lack of wanting to be somewhere else doing what you love. And so I'm partially retired today, I guess would be my yeah. of that. So that's funny timing for you to say that. I, I, I don't know that I've heard that definition. Retirement is happiness. I, I had um, a consultant call me the other day. She had been trying to uh, contact me all day. And um, my scheduler had kept saying, Casey's busy. He doesn't have time to meet with you right now. And then finally, I said, you know, just throw her on 3.30. We'll have a quick phone call. And uh, I answered the phone. She said, boy, it sounds like you're really busy. I thought you were retired. And I said, no, I'm job optional. You know, I didn't have to do the things that I've been doing all day. I didn't have to record two TV shows, a radio show, a podcast, research articles to put in weekend reading and write commentary. I enjoyed doing all those things and I chose to do it. It was a happy place for me to be. And uh, I didn't have to. And I, I think that is what the future of retirement is. It isn't just, as you said, well, I turned 65, I'm going to quit and um, I'm done. You know, it's now I, I don't have to do, I'm just going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what makes me happy. And I can do that because I've got the financial confidence to do it. So thank you for that definition. It really is helpful for me. I'm sure all these things have been so helpful for those listening in. Uh, Brad, maybe we'll have you on again sometime in the future. Thanks for joining us. Casey, it was an honor, man. Um, keep doing good work. And uh, I, I'm so excited. Like this podcast, I can't wait five to 10 years. It's going it's to be like the premier podcast for retirees. If it, I think it's already like in the mix. And so <laughs> doing great work having great conversations and I, I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. So thanks. All right. Thanks, Brad. Until next time. All right. We'll see you.